Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. Joining me today is Peter Van Doren, Senior Fellow at the Cato Institute and Editor-in-Chief of Regulation Magazine. Welcome back to the show, Peter. This is our first solo, my first solo interview with you without uh, Aaron Ross Powell. So hopefully uh, we can have a good conversation. I agree. I hope we uh, we don't f- flail in, in bad ways. Uh, <laughs> well, I am Aaron, stupider but... than Aaron, so we'll, I'll do my best. So <laughs> today we've we, we something you've been written written about for quite a while, and it's in the news as it comes as it happens often in September uh, of many years is flood insurance, and as that pertains, of course, to natural disasters like the recent extremely bad hurricane in Florida, Hurricane Ian. So before getting into sort of the, the data of what, what's happening in terms of rebuilding Florida uh, because of the flood insurance, can you give us a lay of the land about the way the flood insurance works uh, in these areas and the economic problems associated with it? So I wrote a, a, a Cato PA of, in 2021, and I reviewed the history of not only flood insurance, but the whole natural disaster policy. And to put it in a larger context, I um, invoked a famous paper in the literature called The Samaritan's Dilemma, which James Buchanan wrote in 1975. And it... it The Samaritan's Dilemma is the following, which is after disasters occur, it's very difficult to withhold aid. So you need to pre-commit not to aid people after the fact in order to induce them ahead of the fact to in fact take precautions, either don't live there or make it structurally possible to live there or and we could go on. So, so, but after the fact, the ability of anyone to say no or any any elected official to say no is is low. And I recount the history of uh, even in the you know since Cato tends to divide uh, American history into the uh, uh, the good old days before the New Deal and then the bad old days since then. The, the the Congress appropriated disaster aid to flood victims right from the start of the Republic, and some presidents vetoed things. But basically, there were 140, I think, I, I probably get the number wrong, but hundreds of post-disaster congressional appropriations to help people. They weren't hurricane-related because people didn't live on the coast, um, tourism, Disney, right? They were river related. In fact, the Mississippi River was a a big deal, and the Mississippi it still is, river, but like the the flooding of it in 1927, for example, were really was really a big, big deal. Deals. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and in '93, and you know, mm-hmm. I mean, the mm-hmm. and commerce depends on the Mississippi River. Lots of businesses are located on the business on the Mississippi River. So, the kind of libertarian notion of people took care of themselves prior to 1930, whatever, not really true. I mean, the Red Cross played a large role, a much larger role than it does now, but um, the there were business interests that lobbied extensively for river uh, flood aid and the uh, river flood projects. The levees and the all the stuff we associate with the Army Corps of Engineers was um, not just random constituent Demands it was business interests that really uh, wanted this uh, river to work for them because it was that it was the railroad. I mean, it was it was a railroad along with railroads, and uh, so anyway. So post World War II, ad hoc disaster aid got more extensive because people started to live in Florida and in Texas along the coast and tourism was picking up. And um, so there were larger and larger congressional expenditures and 1965 was sort of a high point for that following a set of of hurricanes. And then ironically, the Congress um, tried, well, they created a commission and then the report back said, let's try to use flood insurance as a commitment device. I, what 
Cato now criticizes as a subsidized disaster was in fact a congressional attempt to get around or to commit against giving ad hoc post-disaster aid that was appropriated. So the idea was that before this even happens, you'll know what you get. Kind of like not that you could just bet on the on the heartstrings of voters, and you have to contribute. Again, there were premiums. They may have been subsidized, and they still are to a, a certain extent. Although the subsidies, um, we can talk about that. They've been reduced, and they've come back in in different ways. But the I've read the hearings. I've read all the literature surrounding the 1968 uh, Flood Insurance Act, and Congress is really. I mean, for as serious as it gets about saying it knew what the problem was and it tried to create a commitment device that it couldn't violate, right? By setting out a program and then premiums and the subsidies would go away. They used grandfathering. They said only existing structures. They thought all those structures would wash away. Turns out they didn't. And, the, and, uh, so anyway, the, the irony is that, um, what we see now, right, in Florida is, um, again, the Samaritan's Dilemma, which is it's happened, and now there's going to be overwhelming uh, public and probably public sector support to help them out. And then the question looking backwards is, how well were they, uh, did they buy flood insurance? Did they, in effect, comply with the uh, the congressional vision of you ought to do something for yourself because the notion of hurricanes hitting Florida coast is in fact predictable. And therefore, um, we should try to reduce the tra- taxpayers in the rest of the country having to to support this. And that was the vision. But um, well, that that raises a question, though, because we take a step back. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm the philosopher here, not the economist. Although, as we always have to remind people, Peter, actually, his PhD is in political science. He just plays a very convincing economist. Uh, I mean, the the question that we like to ask in the libertarian world is, is are there too many people living in Florida due to an artificial subsidy? Um, and we, but it also doesn't seem to me that Florida is, like, you know, uneconomically viable due to hurricanes. There, there would be some way to pay for this in some efficient economic allocation. Like, people want to go to the beach – even though it might get hit by hurricanes, they want to own beachfront property. And maybe to the point that they carry the flood insurance that it would require for the periodic destruction of their properties. Like I don't feel like it would be the most efficient thing for Florida to be empty. Uh, but we don't we don't Co- actually correct. know, right? <laughs> correct. And that you've you've phrased the the question absolutely correctly. And the uh the we don't have to talk, but the paper I wrote last year talks about the subsidies and how much they were and then how they've gone down over time and then how in 2012 the Congress passed a flood insurance reform that was going to uh, really get tough about the ongoing subsidies and try and, and then Hurricane Sandy hit in the fall of 2012 and New York and New Jersey were slammed and they're important in the congressional scheme of things. Yeah, suddenly New it, Jersey gets hit by a, <laughs> by a hurricane and suddenly they might have voted against flood insurance and now they're all about it. So yeah, it yeah. changes the political economy a bit. So two years after the 2012 reform, in 2014, Congress retreated. And from the attempt to make all people pay what are called actuarially fair premiums, uh, the subsidies to existing homes uh, uh, continue or were put back in place. Uh, the, 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 I think most people may not be aware though that homes that are rented out, in other words, non primary residences, so all the Airbnb uh, homes in the, in these, on the Jersey Shore and things like that. Um, they are not subsidized, right? And uh, there may be little arbitrage games people play by saying it's our house, but in fact, they rent it out all the time. I'm not familiar with all the legal maneuvers that can one can uh, undergo to sort of arbitrage across the status. But if you read the statutes, um, the subsidies are, are directed at primary homes where it's your primary home and 
you lived there and uh it, and you were there before the 2012 reforms went into effect and blah 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 um so so is it just the case that it really in a, a functioning market and it's kind of we'll get to this in a little bit talking about nuclear power to some extent but in a functioning market no one would insure some of these homes. I mean, like, or it would be so unbelievably expensive that likely no in private insurer without a subsidy would insure a home that might just get destroyed every 30 years. Well, no, they would do. I mean, again, it, it's the question is the people's willingness to pay. Yeah, there's some price, of course, so, but like the price is actually so high. And also the insurance companies can be extremely, you know, endangered by mass disaster events if they don't have a good loss accounting for their own, right? If they have, if they insured the entire Tampa Bay area and all they take is losses and they don't have any good enough gains, they can go out of business themselves. So we can take those separately. First, if there's a hundred percent certainty that the known asset will be destroyed every 30 years on average, then you need to pay one thirtieth of the value of said thing, right? If you were saving yourself, then the question is, all right, now think of insurance, which is, could we make you, could you diversify the portfolio of losses by having houses in Switzerland and houses, right, all over the world in a kind of diversified uh, portfolio? And then would, would that, uh, uh, then instead of everyone having to pay one thirtieth, uh, but let's say, see, again, if, if the only, if, if, People in beaches everywhere, right? Think of typhoons in the Far East and think of India, right? And so if, again, the frequency of disasters in rivers and on shores is such that around the world, there's, there's some diversification. But in fact, if you're only it's diversifying among which kinds of structures, let's say we limit the portfolio just to things on the water, then... You may not get much better than one thirtieth, if you see what I'm saying. Uh, um, the paper uh, actually goes through uh, some of what are called fat-tailed worries and the, the distribution of of losses, and um, I think some of the worst scenarios in which uh, private insurance is alleged not it's not possible by some uh, RFF in particular, the Resources for the Future had a paper there. there. So there's some intellectuals who argue private markets for flood insurance can't possibly exist. I push back against that in the paper um, and argue, I think those worst case scenarios are not true. And in fact, um, it's, it's the great joke in economics is right, that there's we things exist, but we have to prove it in theory. <laughs> and so, the, uh, yes. So this it's is one the of my same favorite thing. quotes. That, yes, <laughs> there actually are flood reinsurance markets, and in fact, FEMA uses them. Believe it or not, the U.S. flood insurance program itself actually does some reinsurance through Lloyd's of London and things like that um, to deal with some of the risks. So there are private markets for this stuff, but um, it turns out people don't want to pay. Of what it costs, if it, what it actually when, costs, when, which is which is a lot of what political economy is. Is a lot of people don't want to pay what things actually cost. Yeah, I mean, th and they try and get cross subsidies to fix that. Yeah, right. Premiums were six and seven hundred dollars a year, right? Which is what I pay for normal homeowners insurance. You know, not in a floodplain. Not yes. in a floodplain. <laughs> so uh, after the two thousand twelve reforms. People on the Long Island and New Jersey were going to be hit with bills of four thousand dollars a year, and they they people went nuts, right? They said they went whining to the government, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> and that's and, spunky and can do American way. And so we're back to there are distributional issues, and and the politicians said, well, should the shore only be for the rich? And the economic answer is pot, probably <laughs> because they're the only ones who actually can afford to deal with this. Uh, the, the real price, yeah, but that's not the political answer. Uh, it, so far, uh, the answer is no. So what we've seen in this, this article you sent me about the rates of flood insurance in Florida because it was it, Hurricane Ian, it was so big. 
that it seems like we're going to have so an outside of the major floodplains, uh, which is 47.3% of homes had flood insurance, but in areas outside those floodplains, which still incurred a lot of damage, only 9.4% had flood coverage, which seems like a bad risk analysis of those homeowners. Well, given, I mean, storm surge of 8 to 15 feet combined with how flat Florida is, right? I mean, that's the key. I mean, that 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 pushed water. I mean, the New York Times had a great map, and they, were, they interviewed people, and they said they never thought the ocean could get here. And, of course, well, you're four feet above sea level, but you're two miles inland. So they, they only think about the two miles. They're two miles inland. But, but the storm surge was 12 feet. Right, so you you got to find some place that's more than twelve feet high n- near the Florida coast, which turns out there's <laughs> it's not, not many places. Uh, so, and and then it would might be a good I supposition that Florida itself is a very important state in electoral politics. In oh America. my goodness, it's pivotal. It is. Yeah. Right? It's, it's. I was it's, understating the case a bit. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, we live in a we live in a world dominated by Florida and Ohio. Let's be honest, and sometimes Pennsylvania, but that's what decides the fate of America. So in in this, we could probably say that this will affect the way politicians uh, maybe give something back to these people who did not have flood insurance and found the water in their living room. It'll be, I'm, I'm uh, sad. I mean, it's a sad event, but, but I, uh, so I'm using terminology I shouldn't, but I'm, I'm looking forward to watching Biden interact with DeSantis in terms of what happens in the game, given that it's midterm elections and all of that. Um, It's very sad that it happened, but we will learn a lot about, politics, political economy, and subsidies. Uh, now, what I, I do want to emphasize, though, even though there will be aid from FEMA, it's not it's not very much, and it's not very it's not very uh, it doesn't come fast. In other words, if you don't have a flood insurance policy, then the largest grant that one can get is forty thousand dollars to help with repairs, which comes from emergency appropriations that Congress may. Um, an act. And if you've seen uh, pictures, the Lake Charles area in Louisiana that was hit, uh, what, was it a year ago or two years? It was a year ago, right? Yeah, a year ago. Yeah. And they still have blue tarps on their roofs. I mean, every, the, um, the responsiveness of FEMA to shelling out money in the, in the appropriated sense is, is absolutely even Cato folks, I mean, we, we're sort of opposed to government doing things. But if you have a program, it ought to work well. And so it's like if you rely on FEMA for post hoc disaster aid, you're in deep doo doo. Uh, if you have flood insurance, they actually do, that works in, in the sense of yes, you're subsidized, but yes, they act upon it. And yes, you will get, you will get the money and it will be sooner rather than later. Um, but if, you're the large number of people that we talked about that are affected, but don't and rely on this post hoc disaster disaster aid. Um, it, it it does not work very well, and people will be shocked. And then the question is: Given the elections and given Florida, will the political system change the rules on this appropriated disaster aid afterwards so that it will work better and be more? Um, it'll be interesting to see. Oh, before just before we go on, just just one sad thing from our perspective is um, something called FEMA 2.0 went into effect in April, uh, which is a repricing of the flood insurance policies to try to make them much closer to actuarially fair. Uh, I thought Senator Schumer and and the New Jersey delegation Menendez is on the relevant committee. Senator Menendez from Jersey. I predicted in my paper last year that this thing would never happen. It had been it it had been supposedly going into effect for a long time, but it got postponed by Trump for political reasons. And I said, oh, it's going to be postponed again. Well, it wasn't. April first, two thousand twenty two, FEMA two went into effect, and it's 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 increased premiums, but sadly, from our point of view, guess what's happened? A lot of people have dropped their policies. 
So there's a since April, right? 165,000 fewer homes nationwide. That's 3% of those who had flood insurance have dropped their policies because of price increases. Was that was that part of the point though? Did they want some of them to drop their policies? No. We want them to pay what it really costs. You see what I So ironically from Cato's point of view, my paper recommended what happened and guess what happened? It went into effect and people have dropped their policies. So it, 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 the data for Florida, 4,000 fewer households per month uh, have 4,000 households per month since April have dropped in Florida, which is not what you, I mean, you see what I, so we're back to, all right, we're going to have to subsidize them. You see what I, we kind of oh, yeah. go well, through this yeah. endless. So you try and get them to pay something closer to the real and they don't want to actually pay it because people are pretty bad at risk assessment in a variety of ways and they don't think that they're serious risks or they're, they're very unlikely and then it happens and then we have to do something about it. And it's tragic. Um, it's difficult to design a system though that gets people to pay more and keep the coverage at the same level. That's my point. Yeah. The Samaritans still, and then do we pre-commit not to help them now, given that they dropped? Do you see what, I mean, it's very, even a Cato, even if Trevor were elected to Congress and you went back to this Fort Myers district, what would you oh, yeah. do? What would you yeah, do? No, I couldn't look him in the face. And I mean, I, I would hope that we could design a system, you know, a better system going forward. But I don't, I couldn't look them in the face, not as even as a politician, but as a human being and say, tough luck, you lost your entire life savings, you know, and that's how this is going to be. That would be very difficult. And ironically, that's the stare. I mean, people think of us as that's exactly the way we are. And yet, when push comes to shove, at least there's some of us who are, um, it's tough to be tough and certainly tough to be tough and elected. <laughs> Definitely that too. Um, all right. So nuclear, you, we talked about this a few months ago. We talked about some of the stuff you were thinking about. This is, it's thematic. I, I, we talk a lot about risk and what sort of risks are coming in both with nuclear plants, with climate change, but you have, you now have at least a, a uh, calculation under some things of whether or not nuclear power plants are worth it and, and, and including things like climate change or just the cost of energy in general and whether or not in, in most instances now nuclear power plants are worth it. And even though everyone likes to say, and it's, it's good to hear more people who are on the environmental activist side to say, you know, we at least have to look at nuclear we can't just say, well, nuclear is obviously better and it's costless and there's no emissions. And so therefore, we just have to build a bunch of nuclear power plants. It's not that easy. Correct. So I think the last time we talked, I said my research assistant and I were working on trying to figure out the answer of what um, the, the following interesting question that we hadn't seen anyone address, which is how high would a carbon tax have to be on the emissions of natural gas and coal fired electricity generators in order for private investors, right, a Cato point of view, to feel that, well, given the tax on the conventional plants, at some point, if the tax is high enough, we will privately, without government help, we'll build nuclear power plants because then we've, in effect, broken even. Well, we what we did in this paper is calculate how high would the carbon tax be for uh, have to be before a an investor uh, over the lifetime of a, of all three kinds of plants? How would an investor be indifferent to use the technical term between owning the three kinds of of generation facilities? And the answer was pretty high, <laughs> but we we had to uh, talk about estimates of low versus moderate versus high natural gas costs in the future. We had to do the same thing for nuclear power plant construction costs. And as most of our listeners know, that's the basic problem with nuclear is it's always been very expensive to build, even though once you got it going, the operating costs were actually not that high. So we did what's called the levelized cost of electricity analysis. It's basically just a present value analysis of all the capital investments and the fuel flows every year for the lifetimes of these plants, 60 years for nukes, 40 for coal, 30 for natural gas, and then said, 
what are the levelized cost of electricity of these um, three types of generation, given what we know about um, their costs uh, currently? And the answer was, or the answers were, uh, for low construction costs for nuclear, it came out at 7.9 cents per kilowatt hour over its lifetime. For middle, 11.4, and for high, 14.4. Coal was 7.9. And then natural gas, right, has low capital costs. So the, it hinges on guesses about nuclear, or sorry, uh, natural gas prices. And for low natural gas prices, the levelized costs are 3.8, middle 4.2, and high 5.5. So without a carbon tax, people will just build natural gas plants. They won't build coal. They won't build nukes. They're, they're all too expensive. Now, what about obviously when you say a carbon tax? Is that presupposing a well-priced carbon tax that takes in the damage of climate change? Um, that yeah. So, so we we then to avoid making the paper longer than it was. It's ninety pages as it is. Huh, we we did not get into the entire debate about what the price of carbon ought to be. We instead just said. Um, academics and the government, the Energy Administration or the Department of Energy, basically talk about somewhere between 20 something and 70 something dollars a ton uh, per metric ton of carbon emissions. So we said, all right. So if our number, if the number we calculate is sort of in that ballpark, then we would agree that a carbon tax of that level which is what academics and the government sort of agree on, if that were the number we calculated, then you could say it'd be difficult to enact politically. We don't seem to be inclined to do that. But if we properly took what the uh, people have suggested the carbon tax ought to be, and we enacted said tax, then in fact, even from a Cato perspective with a uh, investors wanting to earn a 7% return like the stock market on their investment. Yeah, under those circumstances, yes, they would in invest in nukes. If our calculation turned out you need two or three or four hundred dollars a ton, then no, you see, we're kind of order of magnitude, we're not order of magnitude, but two or three times uh, the level that anyone recommends is what would be required to get an investor to be interested in nukes. Well, I think the the someone would be listening and saying the problem here, Peter, is that you're you're pricing you're you're trying to price out what could be a catastrophic end of human existence via climate change, and you're trying to say, well, good thing is that that the people who are extremely afraid, of the you know, the the world, what was the the line from AOC, you know, if we don't fix this by 2030, then human Humanity will be in a very bad way and will be only able to carry maybe a billion people on the planet and all these kind of ideas. Well, then the costs would be astronomical. We could include hurricanes, uh, debatable proposition, natural disasters, the inability to farm different parts of the planet. So the real cost of carbon should be much higher than it actually is, which I guess – I guess you could run the paper and just imagine even higher carbon costs uh, at the at the catastrophic level. It, we don't. Um, we take an agnostic position for the purposes of the paper of what the real price of carbon ought to be, right? And we can. People vary in their risk aversion. People vary in the in the uh, in their view of the accuracy of the various scientific models that try to make estimates. Not about let's call something called normal climate change, right? Whatever we might call that. But but then the disaster, right? The green Greenland ice sheet melting uh, or the Gulf Stream changing its direction so that Northern Europe is now is like Labrador rather than as pleasant as it is now. So we don't, but what our paper does allow the reader to do is that if you believe the worst case scenarios, and you um, want nuclear power rather than natural gas-fired uh, electric generation, in effect, you're saying you believe in that the carbon tax needs to be the kind of numbers that we calculate, right? That's 
Again, it's an if-then uh, proposition. And uh, what we come up with is, you know, numbers like that. Um, basically, in the two and three hundred dollars a ton range, if capital costs of nuclear power remain as high as they are, I mean, that's the real problem. So if, in order to get nuclear power to work from any uh, carbon tax level that people currently recommend, again, let's say in the 70 range, you'd have to have nuclear power plant construction costs go down from go down by about 65% from where they are now in the United States. And there's no indication that they're going down at all, right? I mean, they're, they're probably going to go up about 65%. <laughs> well, no, in fact, it, the opposites happen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and you'd have to assume natural gas prices are at the level they are now for the next 30 years, right? The, the kind of post-Putin natural gas spike we're in now because of the Ukraine issues and, and people worried about that and the, uh, the inability of ramping up natural gas production post-pandemic. It's been slower well, it hasn't actually been slower than we thought. It's actually just, there's now just demand from Europe that we're filling, we're exporting that we didn't think we'd have to deal with. So if nuclear power plant costs are lower than they've ever been and natural gas prices are higher than they've ever been for f the next 30 years, then we'll build nukes you see what you i'm saying you should build so, yeah, that would it would be economically rational without a subsidy correct. without something to, to correct. for an investor to build a nuclear plant so so in other words the punchline here is even under some fairly you know generous assumptions not even assuming the worst case scenario assuming assuming things that are probably not going to happen it, it it would take a lot to make it worthwhile to build a nuclear power plant under current trends correct and then Again, in the paper, we deal with um, the so-called new nuclear possibilities. There's small nuclear reactors. There's, there's. If you're a nuclear power advocate, the future, the, the future is always look better than the present, and that's. I've been studying this for forty years, and every. I mean, back in the seventies in graduate school, all continuing through now. Um, there's always been nuclear power advocates, and they've always said, there, there's famous quotes from the 50s that it's going to be too cheap to meter. <laughs> and well, the, it, even there's now a version of that now, and they've, they're, uh, there are investors, there are companies, um, uh, there, are, there are Cato donors who are very prominently in favor of believing that the nuclear renaissance is just around the corner. Just some sort of involves, new, new innovation, something that will come like a Well, small nukes that you can make things. in an industrial way. In other words, a mass production solution to the cost of construction problem. I mean, if we built, right, think of Italian cars built by hand. Um, they're, Ferraris and Lamborghinis are expensive. <laughs> and For a reason. And that's pretty much what we do with <laughs> nuclear plants. We build them pretty by much, hand. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. And so... Uh, again, I, the paper uh, talks about the current Georgia plant, the, the Vogel plant that's being built in Georgia, was, was supposed to have and does have components built in factories, and that was supposed to reduce its costs. Well, it hasn't. In fact, they're... It's comically it's, overrun, if I remember correctly. It's beyond... <laughs> it's It's... It's like Fort Knox, only it's it's being rebuilt in Georgia, and it's called a nuclear plant. It just you might as well just stuff it with gold bars. Uh, <laughs> so, again, people who favor nuclear will think I'm biased, but I'm not. I'm just saying that you the costs have to come down by the amount we specify in order to to get this to work. And the new small nuclear modular folks believe that that's going to happen and if it doesn't happen then i will i'll say that's fine I, I i didn't i don't nothing in the past suggests it's going to happen but it it may happen it could i'm yeah. not precluding it um some of our listeners may worry about isn't it the safety issue isn't it nuclear regulated too much but 
Again, the cost overruns are across the world under such a variety of regimes. Even China, right? The, the same kind of nukes that are being built in Georgia, the, the versions of the AP-1000 that Westinghouse designed and went bankrupt over, by the way. They were the one, they're, China's using them too. Well, China's given up the ghost. They're, they, they don't want them either. Uh, so there is a plant being built in the Middle East, and it looks like it may be equal to the $4,000 a kilowatt of capacity that we use as our, that's our low uh, estimate of possible costs in our analysis. And because it's the lowest numbers we've seen in the world. But there's a plan in Finland and there's a plant in France. France is very pro-nuke. There's a plant in England, right? So across regimes in the Western world, um, there's nothing lower than, I mean, these plants are now, they're not 11,000 per kilowatt of capacity like Georgia. They're close to 9,000, right? They're the high eights. And that's our middle. So we that's the value we use in the middle of our analysis. And then the low is the 4,000 and uh, that we we'll get from that, this. We'll see if plant that happens. Being... Correct. It, it certainly doesn't look like it's going to happen in the Western world. But so that would have to be true. And then you'd have to want a carbon tax in the 70s. And then you'd be fine. Um, All right. Well, so we then, hope... uh, in a blog post, we go on and say, well, the U.S. doesn't enact a carbon tax, and, but instead under the Biden Inflation Reduction Act, there's some subsidies, some tax subsidies uh, that now go for nukes. So we've calculated their carbon tax equivalent. And again, they work out to the same thing, which is if you have very low construction costs and you have high natural gas prices, then the Biden tax credit, even though it's only by law, it can last 10 years under the, the reconciliation rules, assume it goes on forever, right? Assume it's permanent. That would be sufficient to make uh, an investor be willing to go into a natural gas, or sorry, a nuclear plant. All right, so we're gonna change gears one more time uh, in the wild and crazy world of Peter Van Doren's mind, uh, the always illuminating. We're gonna talk a little bit about minimum wage. Um, before we get into the paper you sent me about trying to track how much minimum wage increases actually increase people's wages. Can you set the scene a little bit about insofar as you're able, and it's not like totally your specialty, but kind of the the course of minimum wage studies where there's been a lot of recent studies, that, but there's the really famous one by, um, uh, his name escapes me, uh, it, recently died. Is this uh, from the nineties? Yeah. That yeah. That the one. Yeah. Well, said so David Card, Card and Kruger in Kruger paper. That's Card, right, yeah. David Card and Alan Kruger um, threw a bombshell into economics in the early '90s when they uh, they both taught at Princeton and they conducted an experiment because New Jersey was raising its minimum wage and Pennsylvania was not, and so they started what are now called border discontinuity studies, and you say, well, let's look at the uh, employment levels and prices and things like that for fast food franchises on one side of the state border that had a, a minimum wage increase versus um, what happened to franchises in the state that that did not raise uh, the minimum wage. And they uh, were also different for economists in that they used a survey. They called up those franchises and said, what are you doing? <laughs> are you laying people off? Are you hiring? Are the hours increasing? You know, they just asked, kind of sign of some basic. Are you raising the pay? What's what's or sorry, raising your prices? Uh, but but also mostly just employment, right? Does does increasing the wage decrease the number of folks in your restaurant establishment? And their conclusion was that it had no effect. Right, that there was no difference across the state boundaries in the effect of the minimum wage increase in one in one state. Well, this was a bombshell, right? This, so there's that. There's been seems contrary to basic wisdom. Yeah, sort of econ one hundred and one. And then there's been so much, right? There's just back and forth and back and forth. And the pages of regulation we've covered this a number of times. Um, <clears throat> I've covered it so many times, my head hurts. It it is it's. Um, 
It is, I mean, again, I'm, I'm neoclassically oriented. I sort of believe that there's, um, the things we teach freshmen in Econ 101 are true, but it is amazing, right? If you're a skeptic that, and that you think you can do things with a minimum wage, it's, it has taken a lot, a lot of econometric effort to find effects. Right, and it ha- it doesn't show up in lots of. You mean simple- either negative or positive effects? I mean, that's what this no, one is kind d- of. No, define negative effects. effects. Negative define effects. Define negative okay. employment effects. Mm. So now there's a the, the the most well not the recent again of five, the Mere West paper. I can't remember its date, but they said that don't look at levels, look at growth rates. So then there's a whole literature on ah, it's employment growth that's affected. It takes. A while for McDonald's to put in machines and replace people. And it's not the levels, it's the growth rate. That actually I find pretty persuasive. Uh, but anyway, this paper that I sent to you that we might talk about today is refreshing only in that it's different in that it asks a different question. It says, all right, you're, let's assume minimum wage increases really are good things. And let's think of the state as helping people that are low income. Let's assume uh, you're the the congresswoman from the Bronx, right? And you believe in this stuff. AOC, uh, yes. AOC. <laughs> and the question is then, can we figure out how much the market does or doesn't help low-wage workers versus a, a government effort to increase their wage? And I'd never see, I mean, this is a different research take, and I, uh, that's why we're talking about it. And uh, so the numbers, so they, let me get my notes here. Let's they just clarify. The, I just want to clarify for a listener, because most even people who are proponents of the minimum wage, I think, would say that most wage increases do not occur because of a statutory minimum that comes in. You'd have to be the kind of very a very sort of special type of worker who's maybe helped out by a minimum wage increase via law. But most people's wages go up over time, regardless of whether there's a law pushing them from the bottom, so to speak. So if you say, you know, this is a person who made minimum wage in 20, in 2020, and then they're, what, what are they making in 2021? And how much of that is because of the law and how much of it is because of natural market force. That's basically the question they asked, right? Correct. That is the focus of this paper. And I I guess my priors, I don't know what I would have, I mean, I actually don't have priors on this question, but that's what I should have, but I don't. And I guess reading the paper a lot, I I think there are a a lot of people who don't make much money. And I would have sort of maybe said, they, the market doesn't help. They're just, it's not going to, they, they'll increase their wage by changing what they do, not by the market rewarding them by staying with an employer, but still working in what we might call a, a, a low wage service job of one sort or another. So these data are interesting. Uh, they use the current population survey, which interviews people, uh, and every year and People who are in it, you're in it for a year, right? And so they can figure out where you were at the start and then see where you are at the end. And then this analysis confines the discussion to assume that that we're only talking about all those workers whose wages were within 50 cents of the minimum during the first interview. They And this is from 2010 to 2019. They concluded that more than 70% of those employed 12 months later had a higher wage. For those who received an increase, their wages rose $2.05 an hour, which I thought was... That's a I, lot I, for I was, someone making minimum wage, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and they found that the large majority of low-wage workers, therefore, cannot be plaus- plausibly described as career minimum wage workers which ironically was my perception, right? I had my own misperception that, in fact, even though Cato, we argue in print that you need a training wage and people start out and once employers figure out who can do stuff and who which can't, 
They're rewarded because it is hard to find reliable good workers and no one's stuck at the bottom forever. And blah, general blah, blah. specialist, I mean, Adam Smith, you know, if you work in the pin factory and after a year, hopefully you're better at just doing the specialization stuff than you are at the beginning of that time in terms of how many pins you can produce because of the how many times you've done it. So even though we've argued that uh, theologically over time, we didn't have, K. we didn't have, I, I couldn't cite papers that said, oh, that's true. And I suppose I'm, if I were honest, I'd say my own priors was that I wasn't sure it was true. <laughs> and what's interesting about this paper is it says it's true. Um, in addition, what the paper does is go on to compare the wage increases of those in states that increased their minimum wage during the time period versus those in states that did not to compare how much of increased low wage worker increases were the result of public policy rather than market forces. So they found that uh, 71% of minimum wage workers in states that did not increase their wage at any point, 2013 to 2018, did get a raise in any given year. 79% of minimum wage workers in states that did increase their minimum wage also got raises in any given year. So the difference was only 8%. So of the population of workers around the, within 50%, 50 cents of the minimum wage over this time period, the overwhelming majority of people who got increases during that period, even in states that increased their minimum, were the result of market forces. And I thought that was a interesting result, which sort of reinforces the notion that minimum wage increases by states are endogenous to the possibility that, in fact, they won't have much effect. That, well, it, that, yeah, you can see it in the politics of it. It's it's a frustrating issue for me because it is – the data that is like, I would say, fairly uncontroversial about how many people are on minimum wage for and what kind of workers they are, it's a very – if you're a real big redistributionist and you want to help out the poorest people, minimum wage is is not the first level you should pull in your in your Correct. toolkit, right? Correct. I mean, if it, if it re, just mass redistribution. There's a lot of other things to do rather than just doing the wage, but it seems to mean something to people in a political, rhetorical way more than other types of things. And so we spend a lot of time talking about minimum wage increases. And as you said, sometimes in the politics of it, you see – the weirdness of rolling out a minimum wage, which sort of just sort of implies that they understand that the, it will cause a ton of damage if you raise the minimum wage very quickly. So they're they're acknowledging the economic reality of that, of this. You know, I say, well, we're not going to give everyone a raise immediately, even though we said that what this is all about, because that would hurt businesses and employment. It's like, well, okay, so that's what we've been saying the whole time. And usually, the minimum wage also sits right around. Where the market rate wage is, like yeah. mean, that's what you've been yeah. dodging. It. it doesn't. It's not usually. Oh, let's go from twelve dollars an hour to thirty. Like that's not <laughs> usually what people are, are are supporting when they come to minimum wage. And then we would see some real the effects that ec economists would predict if you ever raised the wage, tripled the wage overnight, presumably. Correct. Yep. No, it's it's. So anyway, this study is in the. Uh, uh, the summer issue of regulation has a has a discussion of this paper for those who want to read the print version. So, do we have a moral for today's conversation, Peter? Is there is there is there can we tie all these together for your parting thoughts about thinking of costs and benefits and and give us a well, window? Well, I, I say the emotion, the emo. The, we talked about um, trying to well, it, sort of Cato and other academics have talked about the negative effects of minimum wage forever, and we will continue to do so, and that will have no effect on anything, I suspect. Um, and the same thing about flood, right? I mean, the, these are, so trying to be elected and be against something that the public likes, i.e. the minimum wage, you can, you won't get elected. <laughs> you can, you can, uh, it would take a, a special district to elect someone who looks like they're against uh, people and, and uh, the lowest wage occupation somehow getting more. And the emotional, the if just interview ordinary people. It's, we don't give, a, we shouldn't give a whole lot of money to people who don't work. But by golly, if you do work and you show up every day, it ought to be enough to do blah, like 
rent an apartment, you know, fill in the blank. It ought to be enough. And even I, ha- I mean, that's that fighting that emotional reaction with analysis, which is what I've spent my life doing, probably hasn't affected a whole lot of people. And there are many, many economists who also think the minimum wage actually doesn't have the large negative effects that many people like me think it does. And, and as I said, the evidence is is very hard. It's it's taken an enormous amount of econometric uh, uh, firepower to find effects. And if it's as obvious and easy as we claim, it should be easier. So um, and the same thing with flood insurance, right? We My paper said we ought to increase rates, and we have, and then people drop flood insurance. Well, now, I mean, that's... <laughs> Now what? Uh, we then have to pre-commit not to help them after events like Hurricane Ian, and that's really hard. Same thing with poor, not helping uh, poor people. It's 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 not electorally, you know, compatible. And and the purpose of think tanks is to remind people of the the truth of intellectual ideas. But we uh, we also our political officials have to be elected and implementing many of our views is difficult. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, make sure to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. Free Thoughts is produced by Landry Ayers. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.